In this 3D Printing 101, I'm gonna share with you my step-by-step -step process for improving the accuracy of your 3D prints. So you can conquer the clearance castle or just improve the quality of your 3D prints in general. Let's get started. How's it going guys, Angus here from Makers Muse. When it comes to 3D printing accuracy and quality, there is so many variables to consider. And honestly, approaching a 3D printer for the first time and trying to improve on how it prints can be really, really daunting. But there is approaches you can take to try to remove some of those variables and focus on key areas step by step to gradually improve the quality and accuracy of your 3D prints. And this video has been heavily requested since I released my Clearance Castle. This is a very challenging 3D print to test your printer's accuracy and quality. With various moving parts, it has to come apart and your printer has to be in tip-top condition with the perfect settings to pull this off. This video is split up into several sections and you can find the timestamps below. So before we do anything else on this list, we need to make sure the first layer is going down correctly it's not too close or not too far. Because if it's too close, the first layers will squish together and with parts with uh, multiple moving parts like the clearance castle, that will weld everything together. And that means it won't work. So I've talked about using a clearance gauge many, many times on the channel in the past of that, and that's my technique for getting a good first layer. I have a clearance gauge of 0.2 millimeters thickness. And what I do is I'll home everything. So I'll home the print bed and then I'll move the Z axis up 0.2. I'll make sure everything's heated, so preheat it to operating temperature. And then I'll use that feeler gauge to then make sure the nozzle just clears it at all points on a manually leveled bed. And then I'll check it with a large print to see how that first layer is laying down. Here's an example of a print that's a little bit too far away. So you can usually tell that the layers come out looking a little bit stringy, not, not joined together nicely, and sometimes even like wiggly, that's when you're way too far away. And if you're too close, a, you might dig into the print surface and damage the nozzle or the print surface, or it becomes very, very obvious because you get these weird sort of artifacts as it's squishing material out of the way because it doesn't have enough room to extrude correctly. And what you will do if you end up printing like this, because it usually will still complete, is you get this effect, which is known as elephant's foot, where it extrudes too much and it bulges out and then comes back in. So that bulging will ruin your prints by welding them together. And if you don't really care about that, fine, but it will ruin the surface finish and accuracy as well. So you get that nasty bulging at the bottom, which doesn't look very nice. And it means the overall height will be incorrect because it's switched the bottom too much. So the Z height will be wrong. Once you're confident that you've got a great first layer, then you need to start worrying about your printer's actual accuracy. So how 3D printers work is you send them G code, which is essentially commands to move in certain coordinates. And then the machine will then tell the motors to spin a certain amount. And then hopefully that certain amount translates into an accurate movement in the dimensions that you want. And the motors are called stepper motors for a reason. They move in steps. So what you need to calibrate is your steps per millimeter. That is how many steps are involved per millimeter of movement. So from the factory, you would hope the printer come fully calibrated with the correct steps per millimeter, but sometimes they don't. So a good test print to start with is a calibration cube like this. This is a Cheps cube, a Chuck Hellebuck. It's a great little quick test print and it's meant to be 20 millimeters on every dimension. So what do you want is you want to print this out and grab a pair of calipers and then you're gonna use that to measure the different dimensions and you want it to be pretty close, but it's very unlikely you'll be dead on 20 because these machines, again, they're extruding plastic out of a 0.4 millimeter nozzle generally and they're not gonna be perfect. Nothing in the real world is actually perfect. So this is like 19.96, this is the Z dimension so 20 and then this one is 19.96 so that is so close this is off an end of three uh, and that's telling me that the steps per millimeter are very very close if they are very much wrong for example your cube is 22 millimeters or 19 or 18 millimeters in size or even different in different dimensions that's telling you that the uh, steps per millimeter are very wrong so different printers have different ways you can fix this but generally what you can do is connect to the machine using something like Repetier, and then you can go into the EEPROM settings from there. And then you can actually look at what the measurements are for steps per millimeter in the machine, and then you can change them. But what do you change them to? Well, this is fantastic formula, which is very easy to use. Basically, what you wanna do is tell the machine to move a certain known amount, for example, 100 millimeters, and you wanna mark actually what the movement was. And then you take the actual real world movement 
put it into the formula and that will give you the new steps per millimeter to then plug into the EEPROM settings, save that. And if you are tweaking those measurements, that's also worth checking your extruder's steps per millimeters, otherwise known as E-steps. So again, this is easy to test. You want to try to extrude or withdraw a known distance. Again, 100 millimeters is a good amount and then see actually how much it does move that filament. Then again, plug that into the calculation to get the true number of steps per millimeter for your extruder. Okay, so what I'd like to tackle next is stringing. Stringing is the bane of my existence when I'm testing 3D printers. It looks terrible and it really does ruin your part accuracy because especially if you have parts that are meant to move together, like this for example, the strings act as little tiny little webs of glue that bond each layer together and overall, it not only ruins the appearance, but also can just weld parts together. Stringing is caused by a number of factors, but generally it's caused by incorrect retraction settings. So with filament-based 3D printers, it pushes plastic filament through a hot end, melts it, and it extrudes that molten plastic out to create the part. When it needs to move between points, it can't just stop because there's like a built up pressure in the hot end and it's, it's also liquid. So it wants to just drip out on its own. So what it does is it sort of does it as it moves between points, it leaves this string behind. So we need retraction settings, which pulls the filament back a certain amount to relieve that pressure and hopefully stop it dripping out of the hot end. And different printers, different extruder designs, different nozzle designs, different hot end designs all have different retraction requirements. The most extreme I would say would be the Ender 3 Bowden style extruders, where they have this long tube where the filament's forced through and the motor's actually right at the other end. It's got this long Bowden tube. They generally need a much higher amount of retraction than direct drive extruders. So what you wanna do is print out this really simple stringing test. It takes like 10 minutes to print and I would start with some sort of default setting and then see what it looks like. This is an example of a print with very, very bad stringing where essentially it hasn't retracted enough or sometimes, sometimes you're retracting too much and that adds too much time between um, pulling up and moving which means that some filament can actually just start leaking out on its own because you can't suck it back into the nozzle. It's not physically possible. It can't form a suction. It's not how it works. You can go too far with retraction. It, also, it can also cause jams, but too little and it will also cause stringing. There's also various other retraction settings to think about, such as the retraction speeds. Don't want to go too fast uh, or too slow. And also then there's the wipe, which is really a key I find with very dribbly extruders, where it will do like a little, it'll sort of stop extruding and do a little wipe in the part before moving. And I do find that helps a lot to cut stringing down. I do find also that having Z hop, where the machine will actually lift up in Z before moving, increases stringing, but also decreases the chance of collisions because you think you're putting a sort of flat plane. If the parts move up a little bit, for example, as they cool, they might warp, the nozzle can then collide with them. So. Z-hop is meant to get around that by moving it up between points, but also that movement adds time and therefore that plastic can start dribbling out and add stringing. And then finally, there's the material to consider. Different filaments have different tendencies to string. For example, flexible filaments string a lot. Some materials will absorb moisture, such as polyamides like nylons, and that makes them bubble and spit as they extrude. So if you don't fully dry them, that'll force filament out across points. So even if you have the best retraction settings in the world, it'll still string like crazy. If it sounds frustrating, it is, and it can be tedious dialing down filaments. There's temperatures to consider, there's the moisture levels to consider. But if you do have, have some known good filament, then you can sort of fight at least that variable. You can tick that off and go into your settings. And again, for most printers on the market, there's a huge range of defaults you can start with. And if you have an Ender 3 and you're suffering with stringing, I have this ancient video here, which has helped probably thousands of people by this point by doing a certain setting in Cura called combing, which just cuts stringing down heaps. Next up on the list is cooling and overhangs. Insufficient cooling is my pet peeve for 3D printers on the market today. They all seem to come with really crappy cooling ducts and they're just not great. <laughs> and they can really affect part quality, absolutely can affect your ability to print complex parts. There's this misconception, and I, I mean, I have probably have contributed to in the past because it's simple to explain, where if it's a 45 degree overhang, you're sweet. Anything more than that, it's not gonna work. Anything less than that, you're fine as well. This is kind of true, but also kind of not. So to explain it, think about how these 3D prints are formed. They're formed layer by layer with an extrusion path out of a nozzle. So most nozzles are 0.4 millimeters, for example but the extrusion width generally will be set a little bit above that because it's hard to extrude a perfect width of 0 0.4 
out of a 0.4 nozzle. It's better to go 0.42 or 0.44 or something like that. And that's your extrusion width. So that's what the slicer is trying to lay down each layer. Then you have your layer height. So that's how much it steps up in Z each layer as well. So a common layer height would be 0.15, for example, which is what I recommend printing the clearance castle at. So when you consider that, you have a certain amount of step over. So you have the previous layer and then you have the overhang layer stepping over a certain amount at the extrusion width you've set. And I'll try to make this image sort of show it a little bit better, but imagine that you're decreasing your layer height, but leaving the overhang the same. As you make your layer height finer, you step over a lot less. So what that means, if you want to print better overhangs, you either want to decrease your layer height or increase your extrusion width. Basically what you want to do is make sure you have as much of that previous layer being covered by the new step over layer as you move up. And I did a test ages ago with uh, vase mode to demonstrate this with some crazy high extrusion widths. You can actually get some crazy overhangs like 70 degrees or more. It's really crazy how far you can push it. But then you have cooling. So the reason overhangs often look bad is because that overhang needs to be cooled quickly or it will droop down. And when we're talking about PLA at least, you want the cooling to be as strong as possible. You want it to hit that previous layer, bond and then solidify in place as quick as possible. And that way you'll get the best looking print. The problem with uh, cooling ducts on most commercial 3D printers is they're unidirectional. So you look at this one for example, it comes from one direction. And that means when you print overhangs, then the direction that the cooling duct's facing, they'll cool quicker, but the overhangs on the other side will not because it's facing the wrong way. And you get a visible quality difference of your overhangs depending on what direction the stupid fan duct is facing, which is why omnidirectional fan ducts are good or just make a upgrade where you get a big squirrel cage fan and then blast more air at the part. And that will also help too. But this part doesn't just have overhangs to contend with, it also has bridging. And bridging again is a cooling thing. To get good bridges, you need really good cooling because you're stretching across gaps with molten filament. And yes, it does have this interesting ability to kind of form like a rope, uh, which is why bridging works with filament based 3D printers so well. You kind of want that to cool as quickly as possible, but it will stretch and could form fairly okay. But if you're finding your bridges droop heaps, and they're not forming correctly, again, that is a cooling problem, which can be addressed with upgrades or by changing your print speeds. I find with bridging though, printing slower doesn't make them better. You kind of need a certain amount of speed to do them. If you go slow, they actually kind of just tend to droop down on their own, even if you have decent cooling. Next up is your layer accuracy. So when you're printing any of these demo prints, if you notice that the layers seem to be really inconsistent, or maybe there's actually a pattern to that inconsistency, then you have layer accuracy issues. And again, there's many things that can cause this, but I'll just list out a couple that I've seen in the past. One is you have a bent lead screw. Uh, things I do for you guys. You better subscribe after this. So you'll know if you have a bent lead screw, A, because you can see it actually moving eccentrically, but also it's a very uniform pattern on your print. As it moves up in the Z direction, you can see this uniform pattern of it being moved out of alignment as it prints up. So you might have the most calibrated print in the world, the best slicer settings, a bent lead screw will very quickly ruin everything for you and ruin your accuracy and clearances. And you can't fix a bent lead screw. You just have to get another one. If you suspect you have a bent lead screw, you've run the printer up in Z, you see it moving, pop it out and then roll it on a sheet of glass or like a flat uh, bench top or something and you'll know very quickly if it's bent or not. If it's not bent, it might be the print coupler. That's the issue, that Z-axis coupler. Sometimes they're crap or they're damaged in shipping. You might want to fix that. And also it might be the actual Acme nut that secures to the lead screw. Sometimes they're fixed at a weird angle or they're loose. All these things can give you those, you know, those accuracy issues around your lead screw. I've also seen people with an extruder assembly that's a little bit loose. So the hot end is actually moving a little bit and that will completely ruin your layer accuracy. And then there's PID tuning. And I don't see this talked about very much. And that's where your printer is actually oscillating between temperatures. It's trying to hit a temperature, overshooting, then undershooting. And this oscillation can actually cause layer inaccuracy problems as the print builds up. And if you do suspect it's a temperature oscillation issue, then go check out how to do the PID tuning on your specific machine and see if that remedies it. And then finally, we have the kind of hacky approach to improving your clearances, and that is the horizontal expansion and changing your flow rates. So if you've done all of this and you're still having issues, then you can consider changing your horizontal expansion settings. This will tell the slicer to physically move the distance of the surfaces in or out 
by a certain set amount. So for example, in Prusa Slicer, if you're using the elephant's foot horizontal expansion for the first layer, um, you can set it like at a negative 0.2. And I'll often do that to make sure the first layer doesn't squish out too much. But imagine doing that to the entire part. It's physically changing the dimensions of it. So if you're trying to make a 20 millimeter cube and you're using horizontal expansion to create that 20 millimeter cube without doing all of the E steps and the other proper calibration, it might work, but is it the right way to do it? In my opinion, not really. <laughs> but if you have to in a pinch, add more clearance into a model, for example, it's a print in place model and you just can't get the clearances right, they're too fine then you can use horizontal expansion to give yourself more room and create a bigger gap and then make those parts work. Then you also have your flow rate. So I've talked about extrusion width, which is how wide the uh, extrusion path is meant to be set. Flow is like an additional setting on top of that to compensate for something going wrong. This depends on the material, but some materials tend to like under extrude and you might need to increase this flow percentage. But again, it's very, very, use sparingly and it's very hacky. I'll often change flow rates on the fly when I'm printing, when I see an issue come up. And that's usually when printing an unusual material like a flexible filament. But if I'm printing with something like PLA, I will leave them default and change everything else first. I will try not to touch it. Cause in my opinion, it's sort of just adding another variable on top versus trying to fix the underlying issues that may exist with your settings or your printer's calibration. There you have it. If you've done all of these things, you should be pretty far along improving the accuracy of your 3D printer, but I totally get it. This is so much information to take in. So I've got some great links in the description below if you wanna explore further, and there is still more you could explore. There is, again, so many variables when it comes to these 3D printers. So I recommend taking a step-by-step -step approach where you can isolate certain areas, try to improve them, and then step forward to the next stage. Don't try to fix everything at once. If you're changing multiple settings at once and then printing, then how do you know what you're changing? You need to change one, maybe two variables at once. Don't start going down the rabbit hole of tweaking heaps of things because you're gonna just frustrate yourself. And also thank you so much to everyone who's downloaded and printed the Clearance Castle so far. I've gotten so much fantastic feedback um, and a couple of you have found the secret, but only like three. Thank you so much. If you haven't seen it yet, the video for it is here. It's a really cool little print. Either way guys, thank you so much for watching. Hope you found this video useful and I will see you very shortly. Catch you later guys, bye.